It was 1917, and the U.S. was drawn into World War I, quickly ordering the mass production of smokeless gunpowder and creating the company boomtown of Old Hickory, Tennessee. Come with us now as we explore the ghost town of an area known as the Powder City of the World. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 3 of Midwest Ghost Town, the Powder City of the World. This is Dan. I'm your host, your history enthusiast, and your ghost town adventurer and storyteller. Now, we've been covering a few ghost towns or company ghost towns of the DuPont Company, and if you've had the chance to read up on or learn a bit more about DuPont, it's a fascinating history by itself. I go a little into the history in Episode 1 of this second season with the ghost town by Keokuk, Iowa, called Powder Town. And through the process of researching and learning about that town, I ran across stories about another town that was similar. Well, similar in names anyway, but this one caught my attention because the area became known as Powder City, or the Powder City of the World. And this whole story revolves around DuPont, World War I, and the Nashville, Tennessee area, where Powder City was built, took form, and became the largest smokeless gunpowder operation in the world. Now, this place was massive, and we'll get more into that, but first, a quick little disclaimer. The area or town known as Old Hickory Village, which is now basically a neighborhood or development in Nashville, Tennessee, is still in existence. There are still people there, homes, developments, business, and I have to admit, in this podcast, a thriving job done by their economic development down there. The plant is still there. It just doesn't make munitions any longer. And we'll get into the history of all that. Because even though this neighborhood is there and doing well, it was a ghost town. So let's go ahead and get into it. It was a clear day back in the spring of 1917 and the town known as Jacksonville, Tennessee. A town named in memory of the late president and Nashville hero, Andrew Jackson. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and people were walking around doing their work. But their minds were somewhere else completely. Thousands of miles across the Atlantic, a war was raging in Europe. Local news would share of the latest casualties, which would add to the millions of lives already lost. And the same question was with everyone. Will the U.S. enter the war? The Great War, World War I. A war later coined by President Woodrow Wilson as the war to end all wars. And if it wasn't news of casualties, it was surely news of another U.S. merchant ship sunk by German U-boats. And there would be another and another and a grim reminder of the headline that came out just two years earlier. Divergent views of the sinking of the Lusitania. The article would go on to describe how a German U-boat thought the cruise ship was British, and therefore an enemy ship, and sank her just off the coast of Ireland on its way to Liverpool of the 1,959 men, women, and children aboard 1,195 perished, including 123 Americans. The war was quickly approaching, and the DuPonts were very aware, so much so that they had already made plans to one of their operations in Pennyman, Virginia, to switch from making dynamite to the making of TNT-filled artillery shells to aid in the war efforts. But there was a bigger need. The need for mass production of a newer product, smokeless powder. And so DuPont targeted the small town of Jacksonville, Tennessee, with the hopes of building a new factory to meet this need. Smokeless gunpowder. Now let's pause here for a second. And let's get into the topic of smokeless gunpowder. What's the big deal? Well, before the invention of smokeless powder, traditional black or gunpowder would emit a puff of smoke when being fired, which is no big deal if you're wandering the countryside, trailing and hunting a deer. You fire once, 
and the smoke appears. But it quickly fades into the wind. Now imagine yourself in a battle, side by side with thousands of soldiers firing with the same rifle and emitting the same amount of smoke. Only this time, times a thousand or more. The battlefields in war wouldn't take long to be overcome with smoke, and visibility would often be near zero. Fighting in a haze of smoke and death. So smokeless gunpowder came along to change this. And it did. But there needed to be a production of the product and fast. So the U.S. government approached DuPont and ordered the company to begin work on a smokeless powder operation. One that would make it the largest of its kind in the world. Spring turned into summer, and in the amount of four months, 5,600 acres were purchased along the Cumberland River at a place known as Hadley's Bend. And soon after, 75,000 men came to the town to build the factory. The town's name changed from Jacksonville to Old Hickory. Even though not the same name, it still holds the same meaning, pointing to the nickname of Andrew Jackson instead. Old Hickory held a whole different meaning, one of strength, especially as Woodrow Wilson in Congress gave the declaration of war against Germany. Old Hickory Village and the munitions plant was built in four months, taking between 83 to 90 million to build, 700 million feet of lumber, 60 million bricks, 18 million square feet of additional construction material. And to paint an even bigger picture of just how massive this plant was, it had seven steam turbo powered generators, which was enough to supply all of Nashville with electricity, all lights, power, and the power for its streetcars. It had a massive refrigeration unit, making about 3.2 million pounds of ice every single day, which was enough ice to supply a city of approximately 1 million. Now, during its operation, it required 4,500 tons of coal, 100 million gallons of water, 1 million and a half pounds of nitrate soda, and 675,000 pounds of sulfur every day. And according to the Tennessee Historical Society, making 900,000 pounds of smokeless gunpowder each and every day. Old Hickory was a boom town in just a few months, housing 35,000 people who worked at the plant, which included the building of 3,867 buildings and seven and a half miles of double-track railroad. There were schools, churches, hotels, a YMCA and a YWCA, an open-air theater, and mess halls. The mess halls were set to serve over 1 million meals while in operation. And not only that, but a lot of the above-mentioned buildings I just mentioned were built twice because everything was segregated between whites and blacks and even though the Mexican workers had a separate place to live in Old Hickory. But all in all, the entire town and worksite became not only the largest plant, but producer of the smokeless powder, earning it another nickname, Powder City. We'll get more into the good and the bad of Powder City right after this. Dan here. I just wanted to stop, take a moment to thank you. If you found this podcast and you've gotten this far, it means a lot. For those that have been following along for a while now, either on my YouTube channel or through Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, thank you. I always say that it is more about the community than anything else and hearing from you, getting suggestions or anything else matters. I'm not the only one passionate about history or ghost towns, so it's always good to make this more of a conversation. Think of it like sitting at your local coffee house and going back and forth talking about the next great ghost town story. You can always reach out to me through my email, which is midwestghosttown at gmail.com. That's midwestghosttown at gmail.com or on any of the other podcasting platforms. And as always... Together, as we take this adventure together, let's keep history alive. All right, back at you. I just want to take a quick moment before I get any further 
into this podcast. A big shout out to my buddy Brennan and his beagle, Wavy. If you haven't checked out their YouTube channel, you need to. It is Backwaters and Backroads. So that's Backwaters and Backroads. Seriously, it's great stuff, guys. I, I find myself times just pretending to be going on some of their ventures. They hold adventures from a shanty boat. And right now, they travel down the Mississippi and some of the other great American water highways. And they're headed down south. And last I knew, they were in Mobile, Alabama, in the bay, getting ready to cross and make their way across Mobile Bay, heading down towards Florida. So I'm sure you won't get this, Brendan, yet till you reach land someplace. But hey, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. I just want to keep wishing you luck. Go check these guys out if you haven't. I love giving shout outs to some of my close community members. So let me know what's going on with you and what you're up to. So back to the subject at hand. Here we go. This is the story of Old Hickory, or known as Old Hickory Village, or even better yet, Powder City. And like every single boom town, it has its good parts and its bad parts. First thing to note, it was considered one of the single most economic impacts of the war, which really surprised me. You think about all the different things that are happening during World War I, and for this to be pointed out as one of the biggest economic impacts, it not just was on a national level, but really it was for a local level. Think about this a little bit. Number one, real estate values around Nashville during this time boomed. Consider the increase of population around the area and for good work, right? 35,000 people went to work at the factory and before that, 75,000 came just to construct the plant. So things were booming. Number two, there was a surge of shopping in the local stores. Now, this makes a lot of sense. All of a sudden, you have a huge population boom, and all of a sudden, shopping starts to increase. Local business and commerce were up. They even offered special hours for old Hickory residents to shop. But, of course, with all of this, anything good, you have the bad to go right with it. And there was a flip side to all the good things from this boom. First off, DuPont offered high-paying jobs, and it needed lots of workers to meet that high demand for new munitions for the war. 35,000 workers making higher wages than anywhere else in the area literally drained the labor supply. This, of course, was a great problem to have for DuPont, but made it more difficult as a whole around the area. Two, when bringing this rush of new workers, in with the new comes the bad. Lawless individuals, and with that came the increase of crime. There was racial tensions, racial violence, and health problems. And most concerning with the large increase of population was the increase of something like a flu spreading. And this is precisely what happened. In our last episode, The Ghost Town of the Canary Girls, if you haven't had a chance to go listen to that or watch that, go back and do that. I talked at length about the Spanish flu pandemic that swept the nation literally killing many of the town people and workers up in Virginia. Well, the same thing hit home in Tennessee when the Spanish flu arrived in September of 1918. All right, pausing here just a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the Spanish flu. Now, this is big time stuff because we had a pandemic here within the last three years. So it's going to bring more light on this subject. We could probably identify with some of these stories, understanding it, but the Spanish flu was something that the world had not seen since the bubonic plague, also called the Black Death. Now, the Black Death, nearly 62 million Europeans were killed between 1347 and the year 1350. And now enters the Spanish flu, where according to the Tennessee Encyclopedia, it estimated to have killed 20 to 40 million worldwide. Two to four times the numbers killed in World War I alone. When the flu hit, it hit hard for about two to three weeks. The flu itself was believed to have entered the U.S. from a couple of sailors hitting the East Coast first, traveling swift through the rest of the U.S. There were about 20 million cases of the flu in the United States in the years 1918 through 1919, and 548 452 of those cases were fatal. 
In Tennessee, small towns were infected as severely as large cities, and Old Hickory was hit the hardest. On September 28, 1918, influenza struck many workers at the plant, and due to its large amount of population and their close proximity during working hours, the flu was easily transmitted to others. Soon, sneezing and coughing spread the flu like wildfire. One out of four citizens contracted the flu. Public gatherings, church services, funeral services, movies, school, and even court had to be canceled. Temporary hospitals were established wherever space could be found, and doctors and nurses were recruited from Nashville. More than 1,300 citizens of Nashville, most from Old Hickory, died of the flu between 1918 and 1919. One estimated number from Dr. Derivo on the exact number specifically at the DuPont plant, which was noted in an article of the influenzaarchive.org, which I'll put in the show notes, was 10,000 cases and 267 deaths within Old Hickory alone. In fact, so many died that the basement of the Nashville YMCA converted to a temporary morgue to allow the overflow of bodies building up around town. Now, this is not the first time they've heard this story. Our last story, when we were in Virginia, the same thing was happening. They were converting schools. They were converting space wherever they could to try to store these bodies. They were just starting to mount up. Now, I found a lot of great stories within the company town that I'd like to share. Worker Lucretia Owen of Old Hickory kept a diary from October 1st, 1918 through January 25th, 1919, covering the near beginning to the end of the war and closing of the plant. She donated it, and it can be found in the public domain. I'll go into these stories and what happened to the town right after this. Hey there, Dan here. I wanted to take a moment to talk about our next episode coming up next week. I'm so excited about this one. We'll get back to the Midwest on this one, but only at its roots. We'll be getting to the story of the ghost town of Fordlandia. Have you ever heard of it? Well, I hadn't. My good friend at work started asking me about it, and I had no clue what she was even talking about. But in the Brazilian rainforest, Henry Ford, yes, the Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company, decided to try and build his own city in the heart of the Brazilian rainforest. To try and offset the rising cost of world rubber, he sets to start a huge rubber tree and rubber production operation down in Brazil in the 20s. You get to hear about the crazy ghost town and the huge mess-ups and blunders that probably embarrassing Ford Company probably doesn't want you to know about. Well, I am not the only one that has actually told this story because it's kind of everywhere, and I did some massive research on it I can't wait to talk about it next week. I figure I can tie it to the Midwest thanks to Dearborn, Michigan and Ford Corporate being located in the Midwest. But otherwise, we're going to head down to the banks of the Amazon River and cover the ghost town of Fordlandia next Thursday. When I was a kid, I fell in love with history. My parents like to travel, and I think it was a huge part of it because as we vacationed to 49 out of the 50 states, I had the opportunity to see a lot of different places, including museums, parks, and other places of historical significance. I always loved going to these places because in some ways it was like going back in a time machine and learning about people, events, listening to their stories. And in large part, this is one reason why I came up with the phrase, let's keep history alive. Because I always felt in one way or another that that's what we're kind of, in fact, doing. We're learning the stories. We're going to these places. We were keeping history alive. Not letting the story just sit in the attic, buried between two book covers, collecting dust. No, instead, we were opening that book, reading the story, and keeping it alive. Keeping it going. Sharing the stories for future generations. Well, that is exactly what the diary of Lucretia Owen did. It kept the story of Old Hickory and the day in the life at the DuPont Smokeless Powder Plant completely alive. The history before our eyes, the stories, all written down and told through the eyes of Lucretia, and it gives us a first-hand account of what it was like and, in fact, keeping history alive. 
October 1st, 1918, Lucretia writes, Today, I became one of the great army of war workers. My number is 3185. This number identifies me with the Women's Work Department of Old Hickory Powder Plant near Nashville. Okay, now let's stop there just for a second, because as you're hearing this, you can clearly feel the excitement and sense of pride and patriotism that Lucretia has. The journal goes on to talk about her interview and the facility. Let's hear more from her. That day, I met Miss Dorothy Morgan, who had invited me to meet her for the interview. She was riding a horse. While still mounted, she discussed the women's work program with me and promised to let me know at an early date if a position such as I was seeking was created. Keeping her promise, she wrote me to report for duty. This is precisely what Lucretia did. She went through all the protocols, being inoculated, getting registered, and her assignment card, and she reported. But when she did, none of her supervisors or directors of housing had any time for her and instead advised her to walk around and get acquainted. Now, if you can imagine everything we've been saying about this plant, if you will, just the sheer size of the facility, as I laid out earlier in the podcast, she went on to report, I walked, but it appeared to be a hard matter to get acquainted with this great reservation. So I climbed the hill to my dormitory. Here I am ready for my adventure or to give my services where needed. Two days later, she would come face to face with just how much her services were needed as the Spanish flu hit Old Hickory. October 3rd, 1918. The influenza epidemic is raging here. A visit to the temporary hospital this morning reveals the tragedies that are following in the trail of this disease. The problem for caring for the large number that developed the disease is great. The chief matron is ill and only four members of the women's work staff are left to carry on the program. As I pass the corridor to the hospital, I see a young girl, a war bride, who repeats deliriously that she is married and begs to have her secret kept. She's in an adjoining room and a young girl pleads for relief. The nurse goes from room to room, soothing the patients. She barely sleeps. The next day, I found the girl bride's marriage certificate for her wedding. She did, in fact, had married a sailor and declares that he will not return to her if her marriage is announced. She pleads us to keep the secret from her mother and the doctor says she cannot recover and advises me to notify her mother immediately. I cannot reach her parents at the address she gave. It's probably not correct. This is one of the tragedies occurring here. The death list lengthened today to 30. Messages flashed over the wires to relatives, but even though the communications were sent, it was impossible to get instructions regarding the bodies of the deceased. When the epidemic is over, records will show that some were buried in the city's burial ground and their graves, well, they'll be unmarked and their bodies unclaimed. I found that death had claimed the younger war bride We failed to communicate with her mother. Consequently, another tragedy was added to the list, and while somewhere a sailor dreams of his wife, she goes to a nameless grave. As the influenza ravages through Old Hickory, the daily operation still must carry on. Her duties for meals still persist, sharing that 24 to 37,000 meals are served daily with a cost of $10,000 needing the work of about 700 waitresses and servers making 10,000 loaves of bread 300 bushels of potatoes 14,000 pounds of meat and 4,000 dozen eggs two weeks later Lucretia reports 
after an active day that included taking a walk around to enjoy the views of the Cumberland, that she, too, was feeling ill. She reports that she reaches her hospital room, went to bed with a fever rising, and mentioned that she will overcome the flu and determine that it will not keep her down. The story switches gears here as Lucretia returns home to recover from the flu and finds herself on a road to recovery after a week battling the flu and returns back to the plant on October 25th. But it's something else that she notices. The government is searching for spies. Spies in Old Hickory, right after this. Dan here, I want to take a moment to thank current and past subscribers for subscribing and following along. No matter if you are listening to this podcast on wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, and the list goes on, I just want to say thank you. If you're new here, welcome to Midwest Ghost Town. Glad to have you come along. There are plenty of episodes in the backlog in season one and naturally more to come here weekly. Every Thursday, we cover Ghost Town, Abandoned History, and much more And all in all, we feel that it's the story that's most important and try to bring fresh content to you. So thanks for checking us out, listening, and don't be shy in dropping a comment or reaching out to us as well at MidwestGhostTown at gmail.com. Let's keep history alive. This is Midwest Ghost Town. It didn't take long before the government recognized that espionage was going to be a problem. They had the world's largest smokeless gunpowder plant in the world, producing over half a million pounds of powder every day and giving the much-needed supply to the Allied troops to support the war efforts in Europe. This undoubtedly placed a huge target right over top of Old Hickory. Ask yourself this question, why? where Germany let this go unchecked. Knowledge was power and power was needed to win the war, and so was putting a halt to the fuel that was giving the Allies power, gunpowder. You can't shoot a gun if you don't have a bullet, and you certainly can't have bullets without the powder. Intelligence.gov had some interesting articles pertaining to this. One of the biggest thorns in the German side during the war was the manufacturing powerhouse of the U.S., and the supply of goods it was supplying to Great Britain, France, and Russia. In response to this, German intelligent operatives took aim at a thriving but vulnerable U.S. manufacturing sector. Determined to stem the flow of such material to the Allied forces, the orders from Berlin came with a warning. Such activities must not be discovered by the American authorities back to the German embassy. As such, an association like that would draw the United States into the war on the side of the Allies. And naturally, Germany did not want that. These operations began as early as 1915 and proved somewhat successful, resulting in fires and explosions at stateside munition plants and aboard munition ships operating on the East Coast. Therefore, it is no wonder that safeguards started to be put in place at Old Hickory, as this account from Lucretia's diary spills out upon her return back to the plant. Guards stopped us at the main gate today as we entered the plant. They searched us for matches and cameras. It is against the regulations to carry either into the powder area. This precaution is taken to prevent spies paid by the Germans from entering the area. And then a few days later, early this morning, the matron of Rye Hall reported that a girl in that building has acted so that she is being suspected of being a spy. I reported the matter to Mr. Vester, chief inspector, who immediately entered the girl's name in his black book. Her name was written in red and she was placed under the heading Spy Suspects. He then asked me to work with the matron in trailing the girl when she was off duty. The danger of having an agent on the reservation who might be in the pay of the German government is probably the greatest of the investigating department. Say the safety of thousands depend on the vigilance of this department. Those agents planted in large industrial centers give out information 
that caused millions of dollars worth of property to be destroyed and many lives endangered. The suspect here is innocent looking. She comes from a small town. When first she came under our observation, the matron reported that she had failed to occupy the room to which she was assigned and had stored some small toilet articles between the roof and rafters of the building. Electricians had found them. So, clearly, the fear of spies in the facility was largely on their minds. And then, the school burned down, which was a total mystery. So much that $100,000 worth of damage to the building was thought to be the work of a spy within the plant. And then, Lucretia reports more. The suspected spy came to our attention today. The matron reported the girl has all her clothes packed. It appears ready to make a quick getaway, if necessary. The account goes on to say this. Sitting in the windowsill of the suspect's room was an oyster can filled with water, with a stick, and a nickel at the bottom. They were uncertain what the solution in the can was, if it was really water or not, or if it was some other kind of chemical. The girl was now on strict surveillance. And then, the report from the investigating department with the name of a suspect, a girl by the name of Virginia DuPont. Now, strange enough to bear the same name of the company, she had made a remark to her roommate, making her suspicious enough to turn her in, with the belief that she might be a spy. Here is what is written about her. Miss DuPont is a beautiful girl charming and cultured. She appears to have plenty of money to spend and seems free to leave the plant whenever she wishes. This, together with the report given by her roommates, has caused her name to be entered in the list of suspects. Investigators asked today to have her letters held and all information tabled about her that is available. The machine has started to apprehend a spy and a net has been set to catch her. If she is in the pay of the German government, Many dark and devious methods are used to trap German agents who are a menace to an industrial plant. Lives and property are endangered. Loss in industrial centers in many instances have been accredited to these agents. So you can clearly sense the overall fear and concern over having suspected spies within the boundaries of Old Hickory, just in the words she wrote. But as the date pushed further into November, it was another date that marked the near end of the plant. November 11th, 1918. Old Hickory celebrated today, Lucretia writes in her diary. The war is ended and everybody is shouting with happiness, hardships, and dangers dwindle. We can now breathe with one another and be natural. The giant German guns on the battle line are quiet, she writes. And victory for the end of World War I was celebrated in all corners of the country. Old Hickory celebrated along with the rest of the Union, but there was another unknown fear for the company town. Now that the war was over, what now? And these were good questions because certainly DuPont's services by the government to produce gunpowder in bulk would no longer be needed. Not long after, DuPont swept in, closed down the making of munitions, There is a resurgent story with this when DuPont comes back and starts a Raiden plant in the same facility. But the story here is that when DuPont initially pulled out and shut down the plant, Old Hickory plummeted into ghost town status, bringing the population from 35,000 strong to a mere 500, marking the end of the powder city of the world. Listen to these words now so eloquently written in the local newspaper, marking the end of the company town and village and highlighting the fact of the nine smokestacks lining the factory. Some people call them a monument to war's folly. Others say they are nine silent sentinels guarding the ghosts of thousands of workers who have gone away. To someone else, they are just a familiar bit of the skyline in old hickory landmarking something which has disappeared. 
But the nine huge smokestacks which rise out of the tangle of heavy undergrowth, standing vigil over the site of the world's largest powder plant, don't say anything. They, in the manner of Old Man River, just keep standing there as if they meant to stay forever. Workmen may go away, trains may leave, buildings may be torn down, machinery may be sold, but these brick shafts remain. Each year the vicinity has become more desolate, trees and brush have grown closer and wilder, and traces of the sprawling powder plant buildings have disappeared. Yet, the nine smokestacks remain, a last relic of those hectic war days when everything was done on such a big scale. And it wouldn't be at all surprising to find them standing after another twenty years, for they were substantially built. You can still visit the neighborhood of Old Hickory today down in Nashville, Tennessee. In fact, just YouTubing some videos of the town shows a flourishing and vibrant neighborhood sitting in the area where Powder City used to reign the day, supplying the Allies in World War I with needed powder and marking itself in history as the world's largest smokeless gunpowder plant. History has definitely left its mark along the currents of the Cumberland River, leaving its story through the diary of Lucretia Owen and others. The past come alive to be retold and remembered. This was Jacksonville, Tennessee. This was Old Hickory Village, Tennessee. This was Powder City, USA. Let's keep history alive. This is Midwest Ghost Town.